Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. We all know how enormous, seemingly insurmountable, the climate finance adaptation gap is. And what is so intimidating beyond that is how much larger the gap is for adaptation than for transition and mitigation. As many people know, the amount of the total percentage of capital committed to adaptation is less than 10% of total climate finance. So today we're going to talk about how to bridge that gap in particular. And the approaches that we take to that cannot be merely tax-based approaches or cap-and-trade-based approaches. Instead, the approach that needs to be taken for addressing the adaptation gap is CAPEX. Not cap-and-trade, CAPEX. Why is that so essential? Well, let's look at what happens when we don't invest sufficiently in adaptation. Why climate volatility wreaks such havoc around the world. We have the immediate, material, visible, tragic reality of the vulnerability of at least three billion people in the world to physical climate risk. There is the mass migrations that already are resulting from this. This is not a future scenario. This is today's reality. According to the International Organization of Migration, at least one third of internal and internationally displaced people are accounted for by climate change today, a much higher figure than before. Then the immediate material damage and impact, the mispricing of, of assets. People speak of a climate Minsky moment, the idea of a sudden collapse in asset values. I need only tragically to point to the tragic fires in uh, California, for example, which is a reminder that climate volatility is geographically universal, almost. It affects countries rich and poor. And when you add all of that up, of course, there is the erosion of our fundamental aggregate GDP, which, according to some studies, could be as much as 30% of GDP uh, as we move towards 2050, 2060, and beyond. Just last week, I published a column in the Financial Times looking at India, one of the world's largest economies, the world's fastest growing large economy, but also one of the most climate stressed countries in the world, and pointed out that the GDP forecasts made by the IMF, the World Bank, Standard & Poor's, and so forth, do not factor in physical climate risk in making those projections. But if you do a bottom-up analysis of the Indian economy, sector by sector, primary, agriculture, secondary, uh, manufacturing and industry, tertiary services. And look at the population density, the distribution of people, the economic composition, the climate risk, and model it that way, you would come to the conclusion that India's GDP is not going to grow uh, as rapidly as anticipated. We ascribe to the Indian economy a, a, a correction of about $500 billion over the next five to six years, which is plausible, realistic, and it is something that a large economy can absorb, but why should it? Why not instead invest more in adaptation? And this is the fundamental mantra of uh, our firm, Alpha Geo. I would say we have two mottos. One, because we are complex systems analysts, we know that the past is a very poor guide to the future. In other words, you cannot think in purely linear terms. In, climate has to be introduced as a new kind of variable that is disrupting our previous mo uh, models and projections. And the second is what you see here, resilience. Risk minus adaptation equals resilience, something very formal. And resilience, the quest to measure what this word actually means on the ground, in reality, is what motivates us. Because it is the right word to use, but unless you put numbers, flesh and bones and meaning to it, it doesn't get taken as seriously as it needs to. So the measurement, the quantification of resilience is what we are all about, because that can translate into real investments and in adaptation. How does it work? It starts as a domain of geospatial data science. We take climate models covering all of the principal physical climate hazards, flood, storm, heat, fire, drought, sea level rise, and so forth, and we downscale them to as granular a level as possible. And all of that granularity also has to be harmonized to a common resolution. That way, when you look at any place in the world, you can see each risk individually and the composite risk 
for that location. Now, that is just the risk side. What about the adaptation? You can't calculate your resilience unless you know how adapted you are. And we can talk about risk all the time, measuring risk, whether it's, again, transition risk or physical risk has become a major global uh, service, but in a way commoditized. What is the value of adaptation interventions is the missing piece of analysis that we try to focus on. In other words, we're capturing and downscaling similar geospatial data about the presence of seawalls, flood control measures, surface porosity, um, of, of flood control measures, uh, fire stations, all kinds of physical investments, whether they're made by the public sector or the private sector, and scoring the effectiveness of that adaptation. And then you have your risk and you have your adaptation, then you can know the resilience of a place. And if you do, you then have a roadmap. You know what you need to invest in, where you need to invest in it, and when. And the when, of course, is yesterday for so many places that have been caught off guard. All of that has to go on a map. The reason is because in the asset management world or as investors, you don't just think about absolute performance, you also think about relative performance, right? How well or how resilient is one place versus another place? And that's going to shape how you invest, where you invest, and what you do to strengthen a place in order to meet global benchmarks, global standards, such as what we have uh, depicted here. And so a heat map like this helps you develop these risk and resilience profiles. And you can, uh, you can aggregate this data from the level of a pixel to a village to a town to a city to a province uh, or to an entire country or entire region of the world and pinpoint where adaptations are going to have the most significant impact. And again, ultimately, this is about preserving economic value. It's also, of course, about preserving societal stability. Because at the end of the day, if we can create those incentives, again, not putative incentives of, of taxation, but positive incentives to invest in adaptation, that is what is going to avoid some of those negative pernicious externalities and downward spirals that I was describing at the beginning. We know, we don't need to be told anymore, that places that don't adapt are going to suffer the physical loss, economic loss, and have their uh, economies debased and populations decline. What we need to focus on is the positive incentive to invest in adaptation, because if we do that, places such as the UAE, of course, has done extraordinarily well, despite what, according to a climate model, looks like a very worrying climate profile. A country such as the UAE has, has made extraordinary investments in adaptation. And what has it seen as a result? It's attracted people, capital, and business. It's grown its economy much more than it otherwise would have. And it's delivered outsized financial returns. And that is the win-win positive impact that investing in adaptation can have. It boosts resilience, and it ultimately leads to a world in which perhaps, despite all the complexity that confronts us, we can still keep on track towards our common goals. Thank you very much. Thank you.